Call to worship. Hope is gravity for the broken, pulling us up. Hope is the manna in the wilderness, when we want to give up. Hope is seeing stars in the city, when we want to forget the sky is there. Hope is the anthem of faith and the reason we are here. So come with your hopes and your fears, for the God is new life. The God of new life is drawing near. Starting here and now, let us worship our holy God. Our prayer of praise and adoration. God of wonder and delight, we begin our Advent week, coming to worship you as an act of imagination, seeking a faith that sees what will be that is not yet. As we wait for your beloved child to grace us with his presence, settle and stir our hearts in order that they may yearn for that which has been promised to us. Amen. Advent candle lighting, hope can't wait. We watch and wait for Christ's coming. We light candles of hope, peace, joy, and love, remembering the promises of God with prayer. In hope, the prophet spoke of God's promised day and the coming of the Messiah. In hope, Mary and Joseph traveled to Bethlehem praying for hospitality. In hope, the wise men followed a star, believing that God would guide them along the way. We cannot wait for hope because we want to live with hope today and every day. Today we light the candle of hope as a reminder and as a prayer that we might stop waiting and start living, stop watching and start moving. God of hope, May the light of this candle of hope burn inside us, inside us this week, making us alert to Christ's coming and inspiring hope and action for your promised day. Amen. Oh. 
please join me in our prayer of confession. Gracious God, you paint a picture of a better world, a world of peace and joy, of equality and grace, but we turn our heads and close our eyes, afraid that you might want us to help. You ask us to be brave, and we're complacent. You ask us to speak out, but instead we stay quiet. You ask us to listen, and we assume we are the experts. You lead us with love, and we wait on the sidelines. Forgive us for always being ten steps behind you. Forgive us for all the ways we are works in progress. Fill our hearts with a hope that won't let us go. Gratefully we pray. Amen. The good news of Advent is that Jesus Christ has come into the world, has led the way through death that we might have life, and is coming again to make all things new. Hear these words from Romans 5. God demonstrates his own love for us in this. While we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since we have now been justified by his blood, how much more shall we be saved from God's wrath through him? In Jesus Christ, you are forgiven. Amen. Our prayer of illumination. Guiding God, without the presence of your Holy Spirit, we are hopelessly lost on this Advent journey. Come to us in this place as we gather to hear your word. Open our hearts to receive your word and our minds to understand it. Our scripture reading comes from Isaiah 2nd chapter, verses 1 through 5, the future house of God. In days to come, the mountain of the Lord's house shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be raised above the hills. All the nations, nations shall stream to it. Many peoples shall come and say, Come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord, to the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways, and that we may walk in his paths. For out of Zion shall, be, shall go forth instruction, and the word of the Lord shall from Jerusalem. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many people, that they shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. O house of Jacob, come, let us walk into the light of the Lord. Psalms 122. I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Our feet are standing within our gates, O Jerusalem. Jerusalem built as a city that is bound firmly together, to which tribes go up the tribes of the Lord, as we decreed for Israel, to give thanks to the late name of the Lord. For there the thrones of judgment were set up, the thrones of the house of David. Pray for the peace of Jerusalem. May they prosper who love you. Peace be within their walls and security within your towers. For the sake of your relatives and friends, I will say, peace be with you. For the sake of the house of the Lord, our God, I will seek your good. Sometimes, and maybe not everyone feels this way, but sometimes it feels like we don't know what to do with Advent. It's supposed to be a season of anticipation and waiting for Christ to be born. But what does this anticipation and waiting look like in real life? How do we practice that and experience it together? There are times in the church's history where we better understood this whole sort of waiting concept and we understood it more in terms of what we could do than what we couldn't do. And sometimes right now we get those flip-flopped. So Advent became adamant about not being Christmas yet, you know, not singing Christmas carols before Christmas Eve. Instead of an invitation to experience something holy and sacred, it felt a lot more like chastising what we shouldn't be doing in Advent. But what if we did slow down for just a little bit of time before December 24th. What if we took this time to catch that Christmas spirit? Well, Advent is not supposed to be a season of, of feeling bad about ourselves or the church or a season of when we're busy being so pious that we miss out on the excitement around us. Advent is supposed to be infused with this holy longing, this holiday spirit as we prepare for Christmas. 
all those traditions that have built up in anticipation of Christmas, whether they be cookie swaps or maybe decking the halls, caroling, school concerts, dance recitals, open houses, maybe reuniting with loved ones, all of those help in the anticipation of this of the arrival of Christmas, and they really kind of tap into all of our senses. There's smells that are associated with the season, whether it be freshly baked cookies or evergreen Christmas trees. There are sights and sounds that only happen in December. You know, the songs that echo in our ears, setting up the nativity crushes on our mantle or maybe in the middle of your dining room table. The sparkling lights that make our trees glitter and we just want to reach out and touch them to feel the pine needles through our fingers. These tell us that Christmas is on its way. And for us, anticipating Christmas becomes something really exciting, even if you're not a child anymore. So all of these different things become kind of these cultural touchstones of Advent. And these ritualized practices really do help us to get ready and prepare for what's to come. In our congregation, we honor many of these rituals. We deck the halls. We light the candles each week on the Advent wreath. We sing hymns and we, and we sing carols and we give to others before we give to our family and to our friends. We do this because we want to wait and see what happens when Christ is born on Christmas Day. And we know what happened when Christ was born so long ago, the best gift of all. We know the deep impact and transformation his birth had on this world. And we don't have to pretend to be ignorant of the power of Christmas. There's something special here. Instead, we embrace this idea of Advent and getting ready and letting Christmas seep into our hearts and our minds little by little throughout the month. So in anticipation of these rituals and practices, Advent can also be a good time to ground us again in our faith. As we anticipate and wait for Christ's birth, we think about what it means for God to have come down, to become fully flesh and fully divine, what did it mean that God was embodied by a tiny brown little baby boy, born to an unwed mother, born to a working class father, born far away from home, and they'd soon be political refugees? So what does it mean then? And what does it mean now for us? As we wait for Christmas, what sorts of things can't wait? What we do know is that for Christmas in this story, if we put it off too long and we don't press pause for this month, sometimes we just rush straight into Christmas. So there's certain things that we can wait for and other things that we don't want to wait for. This month, one of the ways that the church prepares for and anticipates Christmas is by grounding ourselves in these different cornerstones of our shared faith. Cornerstones that appear in the story of Mary and Joseph, the shepherds and the angels, and we tell that story a little by little and week by week. We ground ourselves in the feelings that they might have experienced. Hope, peace, joy, and love. These are the things that we understand can't wait any longer. And we don't need to certainly wait until Christmas Eve or Christmas Day for these. So each of the four weeks of Advent, we lift up one of these cornerstones and we immerse ourselves into it through the practice of prayer and reflection. And we try it on for ourselves as a church, but also in our own lives. We name the ways that these qualities are already present in our lives. And then we dig deeper, recommitting ourselves to them, knowing that hope and peace and joy and love are values that'll carry us not just to Christmas, but through the whole year long. This first week of Advent is all about hope. To be honest, it feels like we start with the hardest week first. I don't know about you, but if I asked you to think up an image in your mind of what joy looks like or what peace looks like or love looks like, I bet you could come up with an image pretty quickly in your mind. But somehow, if I asked you, think of an image of hope. It might be a little harder to conjure up an image of that, or maybe it's something more mystical or intangible. It feels like you know it when you have it, but it can be kind of harder to grasp sometimes. 
The passage we read today from Isaiah is a vision of hope. It's God's vision for the world, all of the nations reuniting together as one. And in, they turn away from violence instead of, instead of arguing with each other. And they beat their swords into plowshares, and they take their spears, and they turn them into pruning hooks. And so as we look at our lives and our world right now, sometimes having a feeling of hope kind of feels like we're having hope in the middle of a time of despair or in a time of conflict. But God was looking to transform the world, not just as they knew it, but the world as we knew it, and to imagine something new in its place. And so where does this come from, this profound vision of hope? In the chapter before I, this chapter in Isaiah, the prophet describes a world as it was, a world that was unfaithful and corrupt. And it says that the rulers are companions of thieves. The rulers of these nations loved bribes, and they loved to chase wealth instead of serving people. And the rulers of this, these nations, they did not defend the widows and the orphans. It describes God as being angry at the state of the world. But instead of wanting to turn away from the corruption and the violence and pretend like it doesn't happen at all, God commits to working for justice alongside those people who are righteous, the people who have not succumbed to corruption or a thirst for power. It's these people who receive God's vision and they become bearers of hope. This vision of hope becomes really meaningful because we know what grows out of it and what it rose against. There's a poet by the name of Seamus Henney, and he says that this meeting point between hope and history where what has happened is met by what we make of it. This intersection is where we find ourselves this first week in Advent. So we know the injustices of this world, and we don't have to look too far to see corruption and violence and power imbalances. But what do we find as people of faith? What do we find as our vision of how the world should be? What is our vision of hope? Once we can name that vision, we know our call. We can work for hope, and we can let hope be our guide forward into this world where God's vision is one of people coming together, rejecting violence and war, and caring for the most vulnerable around us. It's that sort of hope that reigns. And hope is not passive. Hope in the Bible is not a wish that flutters away like, like dandelion fluff. Hope is solid. And it's not naive optimism either. Hope can be resistance. It's words of love spoken in resistance to a narrative of hate. It's actions of peace taken in resistance to violence and apathy. It's communities caring for our children, our elders, and vulnerable populations, reimagining shared power and resistance to isolation and greed and corrupt power. Hope requires working for God's power for all people and understanding the obstacles and the setbacks. And there's going to be heartaches that we'll face when we turn against the, set, the status quo or when we challenge institutions or individuals because it's much easier to keep things as they are than committing to this work and this vision of hope. But hope is about resisting despair. I ask each of us on this first day of Advent, what present despair and maybe even dismay is blurring your vision? What is breaking your heart? What have you seen in this world and you said, you know what, that's just not quite right. It shouldn't be this way. How can we look beyond that despair and imagine the not yet? What actions of hope can we take to embody hope? to work for God's vision. Reverend Victoria Stafford writes in her essay, The Small Work in the Great Work. She says, once you have glimpsed the world as it might be, as it ought to be, as it's going to be, however that vision appears to you, it's impossible to live compliant and complacent anymore in a world as it is. And so you come out and you walk out and you march the way a flower comes out and blooms, because it has no other calling. It has no other work. There's that amazing image where you find like 
plants kind of growing out of the cracks in the sidewalk or or the crags on the mountain and there's these trees that just seem to cling to hope and to life in the midst of all of that and so as winter comes as the season changes as it gets cold outside we know that spring will come we know that hope will come but right now we're waiting in advent and the prophet isaiah spoke of god's vision of turning swords into plowshares spears into pruning hooks so what's god's vision for us today what needs transforming This vision is our call in Advent, and as Christians throughout the whole year, it's it's something we're supposed to practice. Hope is the actions and the words and the movements we take towards that vision, and hope is ongoing. Hope is faith-filled, transformative resistance to despair, and hope can't wait. Amen. Introduction to offering, we can give without worshiping, but we cannot truly worship without giving. We now bring our gifts, and we do this cheerfully, generously, and sacrificially in the spirit of Christ. Our prayer of thanksgiving, O God of righteousness, you have saved us from the worst the world can do and have promised to redeem the whole creation again. In faith and hope, we offer our gifts that we may be part of what you are doing in the world even now as we watch for Christ coming in glory. Amen. benediction. Be people of hope. 
Let hope live in your heart. Share the hope of Christ with all you meet. Share hope by noticing someone else's humanity. Share hope by listening to someone else's story. And share hope by praying for our world. In this Advent season, we need to see and feel and hope. So as you share the wonder of God's creation, share hope with all those you meet. Amen. May the peace of Christ be with you and also with you.